hello. This is Dave Lowry, the giant. This is uh, Ben Jew. This is Danielle Davenport. And this is Darren Dengliger. Dingliger. Denlinger. Denlinger. Dillinger. Dingliger. All right. I've heard them all. <laughs> Dillinger. <laughs> I would go with Dillinger just yeah. to be I badass. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'd also like to go ahead and do the opening statement, too. Um, one reason that may perplex you, I'm glad to see you're all here anyways, is this whole uh, Lightbox Expo has been about uh, design. And uh, the question is, why are storyboard artists here? And uh, it's on the top of it, you think, you know, why, you know? But uh, we do have something to do with design. And uh, my take is that we design how the conceptual elements in a film behave and are presented in film. Now, there are times where we actually are the first person on a film and and maybe the art department follows what we, we come up with because we're not bad at making castles and monsters ourselves. But uh, in the general, I mean, we may be given a description of a camera angle or movement, and then we create the best way to display it on the screen so that even if someone else does the concept paintings and the character designs and, and whatever, it's how we handle it, how we make the characters act that makes it either scary or funny or sexy. So how you handle it is sometimes just as important as what it looks like, okay? And in that sense, we're, we're designers too. We just happen to design how you look at something. Okay, so I actually sent out a list of uh, questions, and uh, if everybody here is a good student, remembers how to do their homework, they already know what their answers are gonna be, but I'm just gonna put it right out there. And usually we start with something that everybody here probably wants to know, is how we got started. So um, I'll open it up to the, the crowd. Uh, how did you get started? I'll start. Um, so I, um, I was working in theater uh, theater design when I got for a few years after I got out of college and I decided I wanted to move into film illustration and there was a catch which was I didn't have an illustration degree or an illustration portfolio so how was I going to magically do this well I <clears throat> had a history degree and a theater design portfolio with painting and drawing in it and a lot of painting and drawing but when I got that first interview with you know, that I fought for with the guy that I wanted to hire me for the job that I wanted and as he was flipping through it I was watching him and he wasn't saying anything and he's like these are nice paintings and whatever and I was like this is not going to get me the job this is not the portfolio that's going to get me this job so I had to really roll up my sleeves and go back to work and take a lot of drawing and painting classes and really work on my foundational drawing and um, it felt like at the time, like I was like having to turn the Titanic. And I don't know if any of you are out there are considering a career change and whatever you're doing right now is not even close to or is close to what you wanna do if you wanna do storyboards. But it can be very daunting. But it ended up taking me like a year and a half to kind of get the skills down, to get samples together, to send out to an agency in Los Angeles. I got sent out and started working um, in uh, commercials and music videos, which really gave me the job experience to start working in film. And I would just say to anybody who's facing that, it, it is daunting, but I ended up going much later to get my MFA, and I had a very wise painting teacher who said at one point, when some other student, it wasn't me, was having a meltdown, said, uh, he just said, the life of an artist is long. And you're probably gonna have a lot of different iterations of your own life and your own career. And if you're trying to do something like this, be patient, do good work, and keep progressing. Don't let your own self-criticism stop you from starting. Okay, uh, great words. Who wants to go next? Uh, um, okay, I'm Benton Jew, and um, I, 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 I guess I, I started in this because I've been drawing all my life. As a little kid, I wanted to actually my big dream was to draw comic books, so I was going to be a big comic book artist or whatever. But I also had an interest when Star Wars came out of doing films, and so I would get these books with Ralph McQuarrie and 
and uh, Joe Johnston and uh, Nilo Rodas. So I had an interest in that as well. I went, ended up going to art school, and at some point I showed my portfolio to a guest speaker there. His name was Stan Fleming. Stan Fleming was a storyboard artist on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And uh, he had a, an appreciation for old style comic strip art, and so did I. Um, he was into like Stan Drake and Leonard Starr, guys like that, and that's what kind of what my artwork looked like. He remembered my work, and so um, he, he remembered my work, and so um, I thought I would never see him again. And then a couple of years later, uh, I get a call from the from uh, Barbara Bradley, the the the, the uh, head of the illustration department at the academy that I was at and she said yeah somebody from ILM wants to talk to you and uh, and basically uh, Stan had had to turn down a storyboarding job because he was on something else and so he remembered my work from showing his por my portfolio to him and uh, he recommended me and so right out of art school my first job was working as a storyboard artist on ILM on a on a simulator ride called Body Wars and so it wasn't, you know, drawing figures or anything. It was just drawing the inside of veins and and corpuscles and stuff like that. But from that, uh, this was in the early '90s, late '80s, um, was was sort of a turning point for visual effects. And and uh, ILM was starting to do all kinds of really neat things with computer graphics. And so I stand, ended up staying at ILM for for uh, 13 years, working on stuff, you know, like. Uh, Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, Men in Black, Men in Black 2, you know, um, and I was like the uh, visual effects art director on The Mask and uh, the remake of Village of the Damned, lots of stuff like that. And so it was kind of, uh, that time was a, a big time for visual effects. Computer graphics were just coming up. And then I ended up moving to Los Angeles and and uh, becoming a union story, storyboard artist uh, in LA and we're actually working full on the productions and not just doing visual effects because what we do is we, we, we're not just working on the visual effects but we're working on the style of the whole movie. We work closely with the director to make it in the style that the director works so learning the visual language there made it a little bit different from what I was doing before. So, um, so I'd been I moved to LA on 9/11, and uh, I've been there ever since. And so I've worked on like Terminator 3 and uh, the new Mulan movie, Wonder Woman, Logan, Venom, you know, all the superhero movies and things like that. So um, it's been a great career. So um, all the stuff I need to do. So next guy. All right. Um, I'm Darren Denlinger. I had a little bit of a, a different route taken when I, uh, when I started storyboarding. I, um, I had an undergraduate film degree in, from San Diego State, and I came up and I spent the first five years just um, working in the trenches of, uh, of assistant work. So I was, assi I was assistants to, uh, to various production executives, both on the physical side, which are the people that budget movies and schedule movies and do everything in terms of the nuts and bolts of getting them made. And then I moved over to the creative side. It was an assistant to a VP over at Sony who was um, dealing more with the creative side of, uh, of screenwriting of package, uh, and also the business side of packaging, like stars and movies, getting directors for movies. So I learned, I learned both of those sides quite a bit and, learned a, and, and met a lot of people on both of those sides. So when I decided I wanted to start storyboarding, a friend of mine was directing a movie, asked if I wanted to do something on it, and I, I storyboarded in college. I want to do this as well. And, and uh, from that, almost every movie I worked on after that, I pr from my previous experience as an assistant, I knew at least some one or two people in on the production side or on the hiring side, so I could at least get my foot in the door in most of the movies I wanted to be on. I mean, it was a very lucky scenario to be in, because I mean, vast majority of people that start doing this don't know anybody. But I, I had a good five-year experience of uh, being able to navigate my way through uh, through the movie the movie making process in Hollywood, and uh, from then I just I kind of worked almost strictly on features for. God, it's been like 20 years now, and uh, I've been parked at Marvel, uh, Marvel Studios for five or six years now, and it's been uh, it's been a pretty awesome job. And my film, my my art school was drawing comics, was drawing comic covers when I was a kid in, in middle school, and that's basically it. And so you know, now I've been working on Marvel movies for a while. It's been a 
it's been, you know, my, if I could tell my 10 year old self what I'm doing now, I'd be very happy. Darren's done every enormous Marvel movie in recent memories. Like he's, he's our hero. Well, it's strictly Marvel, Dave, but I think that you've got, you got the whole swath yeah. of Hollywood You're under Marvel. your belt. Well, now that Fox owns, or yeah. Disney owns Fox, you'll get a chance at some X Men pretty soon. Right, I think. <laughs> Uh, okay, Dave. Me? Yeah, you're oh. next. Well, uh, this isn't exactly how I started, started, but it's, it's my best story, so you're privy to my best story. It's my third semester in college, it was around the Civil War era, I think, um, uh, 1978. Were and, you north or and, south? And through a, <laughs> well, I'm not telling. Um, I, uh, through a friend of a friend, I, I got a job with uh, Lucasfilm um, Publishing, I guess it was. It, it was this, this beautiful office outside the gates of Universal, and they published all of the, uh, gee, many Christmas? I feel like uh, the guy on Modern Family, you know, <laughs> dripping over it. it uh, they did all of the, you know, uh, the novelizations of the movies and the, uh, um, um, was it the art of books and all, everything that was coming out after the first Star Wars? Right? So I, I uh, through a friend of a friend, I get this job and I'm inking coloring books for uh, what's what's going to be um, um, M Empire Strikes Back, right? The second one, right? Is Empire Strikes? Back? Okay, I'm a little nervous here. So, so, so I'm doing that, and one day I get a call from the the editor who who's in charge of all of those publications, and she says. She says, George just gave Stephen uh, this script called Raiders of the Lost Ark, and um, they're having a cattle call interview tomorrow for storyboard artists, so we threw your name in the hat, and it's at 2.30, and it's better than everything. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> So it was, it was uh, just like a, you know, exhilarating, frightening opportunity. And I go and I talk to my professors, and I'm kind of, though I had like one, one or two of the, the art of, of, of Star Wars, the first book with Joe Johnston's storyboards and Ralph McCrary's art, what a storyboard was hadn't sort of sunk in. So I asked my professors, and, the, and they didn't know anything. They were, so was, this was a long time ago. There weren't storyboard classes. So, so, so I go to the interview, and I've got a big roll of life drawings and a stack of sketchbooks, because that's all I had. Right? So I go, I go there, and I go into the, Steve, they hadn't built Amblin yet. Stephen was in a trailer where, um, I think where Warner Electra Asylum is right now, there was where Daltz used to be, and there, that's where he was. And, um, and I go in and there's like all of the heavy hitters that I didn't know that many of them. But there's uh, Bill Stout, Dave Stevens, um, uh, Steranko, Ed Vero, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, and others, you know, <laughs> it's like all of these guys. Who, Charles Schultz? They, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Dave Nickman? No, he, he, he had, he wasn't, anyway. So, so I go, and it's my turn, and Stephen's, um, so I meet Stephen for the first time, and he's got, and Ron Cobb, who the, we will know who he is, is, is his like art advisor, right? And so I, I lay out all these drawings, and I lay out my sketchbooks, and Stephen, he had his baseball hat and his sunglasses and his beard, you know, and he's, he's like, and he's looking at him, he's kind of, looking kind of puzzled, like, and Ron's like, well, I think he can draw, Stephen, maybe give him a chance. So Stephen gives me this, this paragraph that's a description of a scene from the movie, and I had the weekend to draw it. And so I, I go home and I draw, draw and draw, and, and if I would have etched these things in cement, they would have been looser, better drawings than what I showed up with on Monday. <laughs> so I go, I go there, and I didn't get the job. <laughs> so, but I learned what storyboards were, in a, in a sense, and, and, and how to be ready for it. So, so years later, when I was working on uh, Hook with, with Spielberg and Ed Vero, who was in the trailer and got the job and stayed with Steven, I told Steven that story, my best story, and he, he looks at me and he goes, what were you, like eight years old at the time? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, um, how did I get started? So uh, I'll make it quick. So the, um, I have a message, I have a lot of sort of, uh, jingoistic uh, bumper stickers. One of them is that work begets work, right? So, um, meaning that when I was in high school, I did the school newspaper cartoons. When I got to college, those school newspaper cartoons showed I could deliver on a deadline and draw in ink and it would show up on bad paper and so I got a job in the college paper doing that. The college paper 
uh, drawings got me a job for the f for the phone book, drawing for the phone book, and that was my work through college. And then after that, I got work through people I met there in advertising and and a little bit of uh, of storyboarding for advertising, and then some animation and 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 so in a sense, does that make sense that work begets work, one thing led to another, and, you, and, and if you get a job, this is the other part of the lesson, um, do your, your very best on it, even if it's a freebie, it's for a student film, or, or what, whatever it is, or you know, a friend of yours, or it's some concept art, or it's a thing, and, and then you'll have a sample. You, you might have a bad experience with it and with the people, whatever, but, but you'll, have, you know, you'll have done your best and it'll be the best you can do. You can take that to the next interview. You could put it online, however you want it to work. And, and it, nobody wants to hear that, well, you know, well, that guy was, was, an, was an ass, so I didn't want to do it. And they didn't pay me anything. And they didn't, you know, so you don't, you don't want to, they don't want to hear that, you know, the next, why, why it isn't great, you know. So it, you just, you do your best on everything and you, you get better and better. You meet more and more people on each show and, and they all go on to different shows. So then your, your networking builds that way. And when you give them the resume, you have like five hundred dollars underneath it, and you. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'll, I'll keep mine short, but along those lines, um, yeah, out of college, uh, I got into uh, doing some comic book work. Even though I'm on the West Coast, uh, I knew some people who were still working for DC and whatever. And there was also a company called uh, uh, Pacific Comics. And San Diego, and I, at the same time, Dave Stevens was doing some comics for them. I was doing comics, and uh, oddly enough, doing a comic makes an impression when you want to get an animation job. So I ended up working in animation for a few years, and uh, when I showed that I can do storyboarding for animation, I ended up getting storyboarding work for commercials and for some non-union films, and then when uh, Stargate hit, um, I was able to work on a lot of things, and, uh, a lot of uh, different little movies that you probably like, Tank Girl and stuff. You know, things that you never heard of, along with things like Terminator Two and uh, you know um, a bunch of others. But uh, okay, so boy, that was really good. Um, we're getting into, because you guys are, a lot of you guys out there are artists, so you probably don't want, not the general question so much, you want to get into the, into the good stuff. Um, uh, what skills do you need to be a good storyboard artist, and what skills have changed or evolved to how you're working now? And I know everybody here has gone through that. Who wants to start? I think uh, in terms of being a storyboard artist, one of the things I always like to say is that um, you have eyes that you can see with, and you need to use those as to be an artist. And uh, you have hands that, were, that allow you to execute it. But really, the tool that you need the most when doing, being a good storyboard artist is ears. You need to be able to listen to what the director is trying to say to you in language. You know, understand the film language. And when he, when he says, oh, yeah, I kind of want this to have this kind of Terrence Malick feel or to it or something, then you understand what that means if you're going to be kind of, kind of a film nerd or I want, it, you know, I want the camera to be doing this or doing that. And you just have to understand the language and what, what, he's, what he's trying to get across in his film. Um, so or you, her. Or her, absolutely. And I've worked with a lot of female directors. So, um, so there's that. And, but things have changed, I suppose, now with the advent of so much computers, when I started there was there was no computer stuff going on, but now um, a lot of the storyboards we do are turned into animatics, you know, or, or are aiding in in the creation of them, and um, it seems like the the method in which we do that seems to evolve all the time. I'm I'm kind of a luddite myself. I don't really like to change. I like I do I do stuff on in Photoshop or in in uh, Clip Studio, but it's, um, I don't like to like update and change stuff. I have a, a pattern of working. I don't want to think about the computer. Um, and, and, and I just want to think about what's, what I'm drawing and then not even think about it anymore. But it seems like these days everything changes so rapidly, you know, what the tool that you're using. And I think that's where a lot of the, uh, the younger artists have a, 
advantage because I think people who are younger than me are more used to that sort of that sort of world where you're changing and adapting and learning a new a new program where I'm I'm more stuck in my ways in terms of things. So I think that's one way that things have changed um, lately. Is there anybody or there, are there many people that are working in uh, traditional media anymore? Uh, I haven't done that in a long well, time. Well, these, these oh, days, okay. I'm not too sure. You should ask them if yeah. there's anybody yeah. that. Did, 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 who pencil uses pencils and paper? Yeah, who market? remembers pencil? <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody here never drawn with pencil and paper? No. Okay, so at least you, there's you that. Grow up with that. Do you also, those, that, those couple that do analog, do you still do, you do digital as well? Yeah. Uh, I can film. It's all about a pipeline. Yeah, the digital. It's yeah. all digital anyway, so you're going to have to draw it digitally. Yep. Yeah. yeah actually, there yeah. is like a production pipeline for a lot of things, and some of you, if you're familiar with that animation, a lot of uh, studios and like uh, Pixar may have been the first one to go completely paperless, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of them have, uh, if not most of them have now gone to uh, not only paperless, but they also uh, use uh, uh, Storyboard Pro mm -hmm. from Toon Boom, which is like the production type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, as an artist, it sucks because it, you, it's, ve it's vector, and drawing with it, it's like drawing with a big black crayon. It really is kind of awful. Uh, but I guess if you're doing Family Guy, it doesn't matter so much. But uh, you know, Jurassic Park, you know, kind of suffers that way, but. Um, but it, and can I just say, like, though, before we, the, at the end of the day, the drawing is really, really important, and I can't stress enough how much I rely on foundational drawing. So, the computer programs are always going to change. You're always going to have to update them. You're going to be working a lot. You, you know, you work with a lot of people so that you learn from them. But, you, regardless of the tool, you still have to be able to draw and draw quickly because there's never enough time to actually get this stuff done. So. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think one of the main things that we were talking about pipeline is that um, just the old world uh, word storyboard referred to uh, drawings put up on a board and looked at from across the room, and you can just take a th your your uh, thumbtack or whatever and pull it out and put it somewhere else. And I hardly ever see that anymore. It's usually a digital file, and it's uh, cut and recut in whatever way you know you want to do it but you usually uh, turn it in as a PDF over uh, email these days as opposed to sitting down in an art department and handing a piece of paper with a with drawing on it to somebody you know something actually I kind of miss I think that's one thing that actually is sort of something that has taken something away from the communication between the director and the storyboard artist where you're there's less of there's less of what we used to have where you would have a room full of artists and they're storyboarding at their little table and the director will come in and put them up on the wall and, and you can kind of like, yeah, we're doing like this or whatever. Now, so much of it, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, a lot of the work I'm doing is like, well, I'm, I'm going to FaceTime the director or whatever, which is not quite the same thing. You can, you, and, and, and being in a room with other artists is a certain synergy that goes, uh, you know, with bouncing ideas off of each other, learning what somebody else is good, good at, or somebody talk to somebody else about, oh, this great scene that I saw in this movie. It's like we should do something kind of like that. But uh, but the ways we've worked and the way we do the circus has has also evolved a lot. Well, it's dramatic. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Darren. Yeah, it's dramatically changed. I mean, I have not worked in an in in an office for three or four years now. I, I work I work from my home office. I uh, I I. Submit things, submit quick times like with the animatics, to uh, to the production, and don't hear anything for weeks on end sometimes. <laughs> and so it's the, the the communication process is definitely a lot different now than it ever used to be. And uh, and and communication is an enormous part of of what we do in terms of our ability to talk to a director to immediately get what what they want, and uh, and have them have the confidence in us to be able to deliver. You know with the, with just a few words here, a few words there. Of, okay, I want it to look this way. I want it to look that way. I want it to have this kind of a feel. Go for it. And uh, and we don't even get that that much anymore. I mean, I don't know what your guys' experience is. I, I've this been year has been weird. Well, yeah, I've been like uh, I've been no pretty lucky the last several years since um, Jungle Book, um, primarily. Um, and uh, working with Favreau um, for for those last few years and before him, 
um, Sam Raimi, and both of them are big fans of art, and uh, Sam of comic books, and John of animation, and wanted to be an animator, and so, so he can, he really appreciates the, um, the 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 drawings and watching the drawings, and and there's something uh, as someone described that storyboards are more digestible in a in a way than than my uh, previs or, or what have you, and 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 what what we've done. Starting on Jungle Book, Favreau wanted to emulate the uh, feature animation sort of uh, workflow or paradigm where you had a standalone story department, right? And, and, and uh, how we would work, and we were lucky enough where John was able to keep the shows in town, and so we're all there every day in the office, and, and we, uh, would, you know, we'd get the script and maybe discuss it with John and see what if there's any beats or any moments, any character moments, or any shots in particular that he has in mind for this sequence for a, a section, you know, it might be an entire, you know, two, three pages of a script, so it's a lot of drawings. And, and so I divvy it up with the, the story crew and, you know, and look it over and massage it with, you know, maybe this, try this shot, this angle, this, whatever, and then, and then take those JPEGs and in a, in a big a PDF of, of the scene, click through it. And the artists generally like to uh, pitch it themselves in that animation way, and so you're going, you know, drawing by drawing by drawing, kind of like here, but 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 describing the action somewhat, but also doing the acting, doing the voices, and doing the in, in an animation tradition, you know. And so you, there's that first pass that uh, the artist or myself pitch to to the director, sometimes the writers, and sometimes the writer and the production designer. But John sees it and. Gives his notes, what lands, what doesn't land, and um, and is you know is is very good. Has a really great bandwidth of um, of ideas and things of other movies and great TV shows and and uh, video games and everything. So he'll make uh, you know I want that moment kind of like this. You know I want like on uh, Lion King. He said I want the hyenas to be like um, Handmaid's Tale when that first season when the threat ramped up. It wasn't like you know. You know, goose stepping troops down the street. It sort of took three, four, five, six episodes before it got really creepy. And then there's guys in the street. We got you know that kind of that kind of uh, relevance to um, to the thing. So so after we pitch it one time, maybe two times with the revisions, then it goes to animatic, a, a storyboard animatic, 2D like Darren's up there. And we'll get people from the office who who can act somewhat. You know, imagine that extroverts working in Hollywood. You know. Mm -hmm. And and borrow music and sound effects and it's a fairly fairly thorough and and, and engrossing kind of uh, um, um, uh, thing to watch and 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 John will actually if rewrites come in he won't even read them he he'd just go right to storyboarding it right he'd rather see it and see it performed you know so so not as good as the actors will but. It's the old Pixar axiom: if it works when it's rough, it's you know it only gets better. Yeah. So, so that's kind of uh, what, what we live by. Um, <clears throat> but um, so anyway, that's one that's one way it works. And well, speaking to what oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. speaking to what Dave said in ter in terms of skill sets, the pitching process, the pitching ability, is something that that I've always absolutely hated, oh, and yeah. uh, and just I'm I'm terrible at it. So I want just the work to kind of present itself to, to show off. But I mean, do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy pitching? Because um, you gotta be an actor. I'm a really shy fellow. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I didn't at first. On the first Shrek, I mean, I had done many live actions before that, but, um, and, and we're used to like, you're the director and we're here and we're showing him the, and, and then there's yeah. this shot and then he runs over there and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, that's about as broad as it gets, but in animation, it's part of their training in, in story and in animating, you know, then we'd pin them up. We'd pin up all the boards and you'd have a pointer and you'd go through drawing by drawing and you'd do all the voices and you'd do mm. And it took me the first six, eight months, I was terrified. I was just terrified. And I had this, it, it becomes, when you get stage fright, yeah. it becomes, I had it so many times, it becomes an out of body <laughs> experience of, of terror, you know, and your mouth goes dry. Completely. Yeah, and your mouth goes dry and you can't speak, yep. and as soon as you can't speak, you're doomed. You can't, you can't, and everybody starts squirming and sighing, and it's <laughs> just. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're experiencing fear, I'm experiencing unbridled anger. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting, though, that it's like uh, something that is, that's brought into 
live action storyboarding that is actually from animation because storyboarding for being a story artist in animation, being a storyboard artist in live action films, you, there's we used to be a lot more different, and I think there's a lot more blending of that now. In terms of animation storyboards, there used to be they're more performance based. They're more about a, you know pitching a sequence and things like that. Whereas in uh, when you're doing story, when we were doing storyboards before, it was more like well, where's the camera at? And we we we're not really about you know the the body language and stuff like that in each little scene because it's not necessary, you, you, the actors are gonna do it. So, so, so it's really about where's the camera doing, is it moving this way or moving it that way? And um, with the advent of doing uh, animatics, those kind of, the, the, the way that we do storyboards is, is kind of combining with the way uh, an, you know, animation story artists do theirs. Well, I think the movies are, are becoming a hybrid too, so it's sort of um, is, is a, uh, a progression and evolution in in boarding where you know I, I think if you have a foot in each camp you you don't need to I, I still don't think so in, in like Lion King or Jungle Book even you don't need to um, in the, the Disney way there'd be I've seen their their pitches and their story rails there's you know 40 50 60 drawings on a face <laughs> Doing acting and it's like, and that is, is, that kind of overkill is just it is not you know where it's at either with us so so it's sort of it's still it's shot to shot to shot as it as it will eventually have to be made that way um, but but within those shots I mean a uh, A B C D uh, kind of progression of a, of an expression or of an action or whatever is, is is generally enough like you see in the animatics there there's maybe guys running down the hall, there's maybe, you know, I don't know, 10 f drawings or something, right? Something 40, like that. So 40, 60. 60. <laughs> okay. I tell my students um, for live action, basically, uh, you know, you can, you can have the characters act and stuff, but don't expect the actors on the day to do what you're telling them to. You know, that's, uh, that's their job. Your, your job is to place the camera. I'd love to see that. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, can you do like the storyboards? <laughs> <laughs> but I would say just to piggyback on that animation, that blending is I found that, I don't know if you guys have found this, a lot of what I'm being asked to do is a lot more um, like animation and doing story reels and doing a lot of performance and I have less time actually to draw frames that I used to have to draw, you know, that I used to have, have more time. So I, because it's becoming more like a, a story, a story reel, it's changed the way I draw, and I have to draw much more quickly. And I'm using, and I'm stealing from animation. I'm using big dynamic graphic shapes that are simple shapes that I can move it quickly in perspective. I'm using really dynamic motion lines so that, or just the mark making is different, so that I can show motion within the frame. And then um, I steal a, a, a gestural line from animation so I can move the characters and the objects from frame to frame because they gotta move in space, they have to move in time, and that's what we're trying to convey. Because it's much easier, as Dave was saying, for the directors to see that why, you know, it's much more fun to see it actually play out in front of them. But, and I'm actually finding I'm ending up doing more performance and asking to, and being asked to do more performance and coming up with uh, some uh, more blue sky story idea. So, if you're interested in that, and well, as well, that is kind of a possibility for um, for live action storyboard artists. We we actually kind of have to have a, a more broad portfolio, I think, of skills, drawing skills in a way than we used to, um, which I think is a good thing. I really, really like it, and it makes it a lot of fun. I can give you a little example. I worked on Stuart uh, Little. And uh, it's one of those cases where you had one, I've also worked on Garfield 2, Tale of Two Kitties. I almost said Tale of Two Titties. Sorry, where are we going? Uh, I did say it, because <laughs> I'm bad that way. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we got Rob Minkoff, who did the original Lion King, uh, was hired to do a hybrid live action um, and uh, uh, animation movie. And uh, But the only thing animated was the the little rodent. Uh, everything else, including his his uh, adversaries, which were the cats, were live action. They were actually trainers there to make the cats do what cats can do. And um, and of course, we had that little moment where I ended up doing a scene. I was asked to do a scene, 
and they put it on the wall. And somebody who also came from like the uh, the animation deal says, "Oh, well, wouldn't it be funnier if he did a little dance and put on a hat?" And it, and I wanted to kick his ass right there. <laughs> and at that mo- and we had somebody to actually just quit, say, "Hey, I'm out." And um, and I they they put me with John Dykstra, luckily, because I work with John Dykstra, and we we t- we worked on the visual effects part, the uh, the uh, uh, the sailboat uh, sequence in Central Park, where they had to have the radio-controlled sailboat, a real sailboat, and uh, we're going to place the digital animal in you know the right place. And of course, we're dealing with things like screen direction. You know, where, what side of the boat is he going to be on, so we can actually see the, you know, the okay. little mammal, and um, and it worked really well that way because. You know, these were very hard and fast things that had to be done, and there wasn't a lot of room for improv, you know. And I found I liked working that way a lot. Um, that said, I worked in animation, and in TV animation, it was a little bit different than what we're talking about, feature animation, because you literally were trying to trick the camera with, uh, uh, with limited animation. You're trying to create shots that mimic tilt downs and pans and whatever you can do in like the Scooby-Doo kind of, you know, recycled background thing going back and forth. And uh, you basically, you're the director in a case like that. You do all the acting, you do all the camera work, everything like that. And I wanted to bring that back around to this because I know we were talking about when you're working with a director, you work with the art department, you work for whoever, you get feedback, you get immediate feedback. You even have somebody literally tell you what they want to see on your storyboard. But there are cases where you're just given a script. And I wanted to find out from the panelists here uh, how they actually approach turning a, something that's on paper, words, into, uh, into images for storyboarding. Anybody want to handle them? Uh, Wait, I just wanted to say, um, in, in my experience, the first feature animation, the TV animation, is a lot like it's a lot like film in a sense, with the with the uh, the sort of the brevity and shortcuts that that are in, inherent to to TV production pipeline. But uh, feature animation is kind of like uh, the mecca of storyboarding, sort of in a way, where they're they're given free reign basically and and allowed to just cook up stuff that in in live action the script has been worked on for two three years and you know and you're not going to um you know say you know hey larry kasdan i fixed your dialogue for you. <laughs> um, but but in animation that i realized uh, in my time there that the best of those guys are like they're like half cartoonist and half writer and they're encouraged to to cook up Stuff and and there were some of the the funniest professionally funniest people I've worked with around Shrek and one of them directed Sausage Party which is like makes me blush even and uh, but but he he had an assignment to introduce the uh, Lord Farquaad the the uh, bad guy of Shrek right and two weeks go by and he and he comes back and pitches a scene that he just made up whole you know whole cloth is that the thing where you know it's where the he walks in and the torture table comes down and there's the gingerbread man. Goes, Not my gumdrop buttons, you know, and he's, <laughs> and he's pitching it and it was just hilarious. And he just pulled it out of his ear, you know, that and some other things. And so that level of invention is what they um, require, what they need, and, and, and the better you are at that, the better you, you know, further you'll go in, in feature animation, but that, that's unique to feature animation. Some of that invention, again, like Danelle was saying, is there's, there's elbow room in, in live action, or especially in a hybrid like, uh, you know, Lion King or, live, or Jungle Book, or, you know, where, where you can bring shtick to it when, you, when needs be. And, and that's some of the, it's the biggest challenge, but it's also probably the most rewarding thing when somebody says, even the director is like, well, what do we do now? Or how do they get out of there? Or how do we do? And if you can come up with it, you're like, you're like golden, you know? <laughs> sort of like well, you just, well, Darren just has to out. do a lot of that, too. We're thinking about animals and stuff, but so much of the Marvel movies, uh, human beings can't actually do all that. That's like... <laughs> and, and 
It's been my experience, though, that, that that kind of pipeline, that kind of workflow is definitely creeping into the kind of stuff that I've been doing for the last few years. I mean, they encourage gags, creation, just getting from point A to point B in creative ways. They really, uh, at least at Marvel, they encourage you to to come up with ideas. They're more about the ideas than about than about actually presenting something that is is going to ultimately and just like that make it on a film. It's, it's a, we, we work for six months on, I mean, uh, on, on Infinity War, I did the Wakanda sequence for eight months, I think. And there are probably five or six different, entirely different versions of that sequence. And the same with, uh, same with Endgame. I mean, there's the, all the gags that the four board artists that worked on that end sequence of Endgame, there are three or four movies worth of gags that, that, that were created a whole cloth, just come up with something cool. Type stuff. Actually, and, uh, Darren, yeah. uh, going back to the Hulk movie that yeah. we both of us worked on, yeah, I, uh, yeah, Rick Newsom, I think, and you you might have been there at the time too, did a whole sequence that took place. I mean, it was written out except for just one moment where uh, Banner tries to kill himself up in the north. Yep. There's this whole thing with killer whales and polar bears and stuff, and a pair, they hold on to that stuff. Because I, I understand there was a moment where they wanted to incorporate it into a, a, a theme park ride. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, I remember. I, actually, I worked on a scene like that, and it's like there was a whole thing where you, we were sort of like, we, we were sort of like hinting at Captain America in that. And so there was this guy where, where the Hulk was going to go and, uh, and shoot him, and Bruce Banner was going to go shoot himself. And then underneath the water, there was this, there was going to be this shield on this block of ice. Uh, that was the, shot. Was it that's, yeah, that, that's that's part of the uh, that, that was a deleted scene on the on the on the Blu-ray. I think okay. directors and producers never forget. They were all those old versions. They're like, <laughs> like we're, yeah, we have that somewhere. I was just gonna say one rule of thumb I have for um, coming up with these these beats. If you if you find that that it makes you laugh, what you come up with makes you laugh or, or thrills you as a cool beat, a cool shot, a great image, chances are that. Your boss, and therefore the audience will, will react the same if it, if it, you know. And if it doesn't make it in, remember it, file it away, because I've been trying to get in certain <laughs> certain beats in every movie I do. I try to get a certain kind of thing in there, and it and it, you know, there are a lot of them that don't happen, but someday it's gonna go I, on. I threw in a gag that it was the first moment you see in the movie. It was a uh, space truckers by uh, uh, Stuart Gordon. Oh, Stuart. Gordon. And and uh, it was a. Uh, it's like a down and dirty thing about uh, truck drivers in space, basically. And I wanted to do a gag uh, based on Star Wars. And so you have this object coming in, in space, coming in from above, kind of like the, uh, uh, the uh, ships in, yeah. in the New Hope, I guess. We, never we remember when it was just called Star Wars. And as it gets closer, you're not sure what it is. Is it some elaborate design? No, it's a beer still in a, in a ring tab thing with... <laughs> with the plastic tab on it going in, and it was a space junk, you know. <laughs> space junk, that's great. And of course, in the um, uh, uh, when he starts talking in the uh, supplemental material, what is it when they call that? Where they have the extra, the voiceover, extra feature, the extra right feature. There. Yeah, they actually had my storyboards go underneath for the whole thing, which was amazing to me. But he's he's going and says, "Oh yeah, our storyboard artist came up with this. He did not remember my name." <laughs> oh, wait, you know what? All these questions that I, I wrote down here, we pretty much uh, got through. Does most the audience of them. have questions? Uh, well, we're going to get to that, but I wanted to bring up a, 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 an yeah. important thing. We since have five minutes. We're talking about the, uh, being union artists, and that is that um, uh, how has working in the union you know, been for your career and been for your, you know, your basic uh, livelihood. And I, I know Benton has a story. I, well, I mean, you know, I think when we're young and we're working on this, we're really excited to be working on these things, but we don't necessarily think about, you know, other things that could happen in your life. When I was, uh, I was in my mid-40s, I had a stroke. And so um, the right side of my body was, was paralyzed for a certain amount of time. And um, so I had to relearn how to draw. It took about, about six months. But um, you know, working not working for six months, you know, and then the cost of of 
of the care that that I w received would you know would have ruined me. My my, uh, my wife the same this and uh, not too much longer later she she had a myelodysplastic syndrome which is a, a, a early version of 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 leukemia and um, she needed to have a stem cell transplant um, and so the only reason why she's alive is because we have a union that provides good health care to us and so I think it's it's one of those things that you know people need to be considered I mean there's a lot of things that you know workers it's great to be working in something but you can easily be taken advantage of or um, you know I think that being in a union provides you with a lot of different things so I just want to say all um, that's a that's a moving story um, also all the, uh, the the biggest movies with the best directors are all generally studio movies and they're all the union and so that that's been hugely rewarding and also just the uh, the, the quality of life that that you're you're uh, given or, or allowed with with the uh, union pay scale and the benefits and everything it'd be it would be a much uh, lesser life much lesser world for us for me and my family now all you guys are so young you're not thinking about this but I mean uh, several of us are close to retirement we probably won't retire probably have to drag our dead carcasses off a drawing table but um, <laughs> but uh, you know things where you know you'd have to save and do IRAs and all that we should do it anyway but there's a safety net for people who are working uh, uh, union jobs that uh, you don't even think about it until you start getting a little bit closer to it. They but also again, restrict the amount of hours that you can work so that you're not working in really bad working conditions. I worked in theater for a long time, and I, I won't say that the working conditions were bad, but let's just leave it there. Well, <laughs> well let, let's put it in a more practical term. Um, unlike the people who work in uh, the gaming industry, uh, where they're forced to work you know, uh, night and day to meet a deadline and... Uh, they're getting the same salary that, uh, you know, so essentially you give up a life, you give up sleeping, you give up eating anything but junk and it's in the vending machines. Uh, they actually have a sixth and seventh day thing going on where if they need you to work a sixth day, it's time and a half. They need you to work a seventh day, it's double time. And you know how uh, somehow uh, they decide that, hey, you know, five days a week is fine. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't need to have it that soon. Wait, we're not supposed to work day and night? Wait, well, <laughs> hey, you know, what you do on your, you know, if you want to do a second movie, like some of the people do, uh, you know, or, or commercials or whatever, you know. Uh, but the fact is, you know, there is a, there is a safety net going along there. Um, do you think we can take some questions? Anybody uh, have a question? Yes. I, I saw her for. Um, I have a, a twofold. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. One, when submitting, first of all, like, uh, you know, Well, you could learn the form from even from some books like uh, Motion and Art, or there are some storyboarding books out there. But again, make you know, it look like a movie. Yeah, watch movies. And there's always there's always some film student who's doing their short film and they don't have any money and they want to take advantage of some uh, storyboarder uh, to visualize what yeah. their latest epic will be. And so. You know, it may be a lot of work for nothing at that point in your career if you're that early, but um, it might be something that you, you know, look into just for the experience, and then you at least have a portfolio, and then, you know, you, that to show somebody who actually will pay you and, you know, really appreciate it. But sometimes, but if you have nothing, you know, it, I guess it couldn't hurt. If, and, and look again, and analyze. Yeah. Technique and and, uh, and and just film language. Just watch movies, analyze movies, TV. Now, I mean, it's a golden time to watch t for for uh, really creative TV as well. 
but yeah. it's uh, communicating with the director, or whatever, yeah. and how it works into the process. Yeah. I was going to say too, if the if it's on one. Here's of those, another one of our members here. Yes, hello. He's going to say really quick, guys. There's a great book that could teach you the fundamentals of storyboard language, called Shot by Shot by Katz. Stephen Katz. Stephen Katz. It's a great book. Get that for sure. That's for filmmakers as well. Uh, do we have another? Um, yes, right there. Oh, you're so cute thinking that you ever have any say about how your work comes out. <laughs> you never have any say. You just put the stuff out there and hope it sticks. Okay, well, the question was about um, previs uh, and working with previs if you're a storyboard artist. Um, Darren, have you ever actually worked directly with the previs people when you're working on? To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, on the Fast and Furious movies, we were, they, we were definitely more of an uh, integrated team. On the Marvel stuff, it's all, I mean, we, we do all the, 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 I don't want to say heavy lifting, but the, more, of the, more of the creative massaging of everything because it's just a lot cheaper and a lot faster to make creative changes in a sequence when, you, when you're dealing with one or two artists as opposed to a previous team. And then uh, once it's locked in, in, locked in a fairly agreed upon manner, then it goes to previs and they, they, they do their work. But in terms of in terms of actually like directing previs, hardly at all. It's an entirely separate department for us. My experience with previs is, is even at the after the the movies been shot and then doing revisions, which they always do, is it's sometimes faster just to get us in there to do the really quick notations, talking to the director, and then they were kind of like a glorified secretary in that regard, and then they just send it. It's faster and cheaper for us yeah. to do quick notes, send that to previs, and then. We never see it again. It's not. It's not about us <laughs> at all. So it, it. There is kind of a pipeline that goes to them from us, but we're not really a part of it, and we don't make the decisions about what's going to be used or make the choices. And, and I never have. They're very protective as a bunch, and uh, there was a there was a time when there was more interacting with mm -hmm. and even overseeing. Uh, your board's interpret, interpreted, but at some point there was a, a line drawn where, uh, uh, so to speak, no pun intended. There was something about the, the quickness of drawing. You know, I was working on Venom and they had done some 3D animatic stuff, um, but, you know, they wanted to change stuff and all the heads of state could not make up their mind about things. So we would have to give them lots of alternatives so we would quickly do some, some rough drawings and then and then um, we had an effects editor who's, who would edit it into the cut and say, well, did, what if we did it kind of like this, kind of like this? And then all, eventually, at some point, we would hope that all the heads of state would say, yeah, yeah, that works. And then they could send it to the, um, then they could send it to the animatics and then they would, they would do a more comprehensive uh, 3D animatic. But a lot of times, you, you know, you get a lot of people fighting with each other and trying to find, um, do ideas and, and uh, you just have to uh, hope that they can get something. And dr sometimes drawing is the quickest way to do that. OK, I mean, uh, some of us are going to be around. In fact, I'm the only one that really has to rush over to the, uh, the ADG booth to do my demo. But um, we're going to be, uh, many of us are going to be around. And I hope you come over to the booth and find out who's going to be there. But a lot of the questions that you're asking, you can talk to us and directly, OK? and. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and escape the room so I can make it over there, but these guys are slower than me. Um, so if you have any uh, other questions, um, you know, feel free. And uh, Thanks, Tim. I hope we do this again sometime. This is the first time for Lightbox, and I hope we're going to be here again to talk to either you or the next group of people who are hoping to get into the business. So I would like to thank uh, Darren Dengliger and uh, Danell Davenport and... Benton Jew and Dave Lowry. I'm Tim Burgard. Hi. Thanks, Goodbye. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>